Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will define what are the cosets in a general group and then we will see some of the properties of cosets, important properties. So, let us start with uh, G being abstract group. So, let us uh, denote uh, star by the binary operation on G. So, this is a group with the binary operation star. So, then let us fix one subgroup of G. So, this is a subgroup. So, we have seen many examples of cosets uh, in various examples. Okay. So, now uh, we want to abstract uh, the things that we have learnt in those examples and then we want to consider for example, translations of H. So, what, what, what is the meaning of translations of H in an abstract group? So, if you think about it, translation is being just addition okay, in that respective group in EJ for example, in the vector space and so on. So, the addition is what used in defining the translation of some subgroup. So, now we have this binary operation. So, we will use this binary operation to actually uh, try to define the coset of this subgroup H. Okay. For that, we have to fix some element X in G and then we can define what is called this left coset is uh, denoted by X H. So, this is by definition, this is uh, you take all possible products okay, X star H where H is coming from capital H. So, this is called the left. Okay. So, it is actually one of the left. So, it is a left coset of H of course, with respect to the element X. Okay. So, then I can say with respect to X. Similarly, because uh, given group not necessarily uh, need to be actually abelian. So, we can have many non-abelian groups that we have already seen symmetric groups or such groups. So, in particularly, uh, we can also talk about right coset. Okay. So, it is very clear that uh, we will also see some examples. These right cosets may not be equal to left cosets unless the group is that you begin with abelian. Okay. So, later we will see in some cases when they will be equal. But anyway, this is again defined to be you take the product H star X where H is coming from capital H. So, this is actually right coset. So, people actually uh, the, the theory of left cosets and the right cosets they are parallel. Okay. People choose to work with uh, one of them. So, we will actually uh, choose to work with uh, uh, only the left cosets. Okay. So, because you can easily see that there is a natural bijection from this uh, left coset and the right coset. Okay. So, because uh, we will use this uh, cosets to understand the group itself. Okay. So, as we seen in the examples, so we will collect all these cosets and then see what kind of properties they have. So, the example suggests that the cosets they will form a partition of G. Okay. That is what we are going to prove and first we determine when two cosets are equal. So, because the theory of left cosets is very parallel to the theory of right cosets, so, we just work with uh, left cosets. So, we will just only work with this. Okay. So, here is first of all one easy observation. So, if we take this left coset and then we can define this map to right coset. Okay. Let us call it F. So, then F of H X H we can define to be H X. Okay. So, note that uh, so once the underlying uh, binary operation is understood, we can drop using the st uh, star between writing element between the elements. Okay. Uh, 
so we will just drop them and then uh, it is understood that the multiplication is uh, actually means the the binary operation that is applied that is coming from the group okay so this is not very it is not very hard to see this is indeed this f is well uh, well defined by jt so this is uh, well defined bijective map okay so how one can prove this for example well defined is obvious if i take x h1 which is same as x h2 then that would immediately imply that by this uh, left cancellation property h1 equal to h2 okay and it's not that hard to see so this is if and only if h1 x equal to h2 x and which is if and only if x h1 equal to x h2. So, you do just left multiply by x inverse and then right multiply by x and then similarly right multiply by x inverse and then left multiply x. So, this, this is true. So, in particularly f is well defined as well as it is injective map and by definition you can see that it is actually surjective map. So, this is going this gives you bijective map. So, this is also one of the reason there is a natural bijection, bijection between them. So, we can choose to work with one of them. So, now as the examples suggest okay. So, let us try to understand. So, what is happening between these uh, cosets. So, basically what we are doing let us consider the group okay. See the group already has a binary operation okay. So, this right multiplication and left multiplication they are very very well defined uh, maps okay. So, though those maps going to give you lots of symmetries inside your group okay. So, all this will be made sense later but anyway it is very clear that what we are talking about. So, then the group for example will possess lots of symmetry. So, the group let us say looks like this okay. So, then your subgroup looks something like this okay. This is your h. So, then if you take this h and then if you multiply by some element of g. So, then you will get what is called x h, but the x h should exactly look like h only. So, it cannot look like something else okay. Of course, I have drawn it very badly, but you can see that the group cannot be like this okay. So, we have to change bit. So, this has to look exactly like this. So, then if you apply another y, so you may end up somewhere here and then this is your, your y h, it will be the y h okay. So, what I am trying to say this h and this x h, so they in some sense they should look alike. But what is the meaning of they should look look alike in general groups okay. So, in general groups we have only the binary operation nothing else. So, one can think g as only a set okay no more structures are given there only this this binary operations is there that makes this g as a group. So, in that generality what is the meaning of h and x h they look like look, look alike. So, that means they there is a natural bijective correspondence between them and that correspondence is given by h goes to x h okay. So, let us verify this. So, this is actually a bijective correspondence. So, how to verify this for example, if this is well defined map because h1 equal to h2 will imply x h1 equal to x h2 by doing this uh, lift multiplication by x and suppose x h1 equal to x h2 then that would imply by multiplying by x inverse on the both side you can get x inverse times x inverse h2. So, that would imply that h1 equal to h2. So, that means this map is injective and as well as well defined. 
So, by definition you can see that it is on to because any element of x h will look like x small h where small h is coming from capital H. So, this is the bijective correspondence ok. So, that is the box we can say in the general groups ok. Suppose if your group has extra structure for example, uh, if it is actually a topological space then this lift multiplication is continuous then this is actually a homomorphism between h and xh ok. So, such things also can be told if, if your group to begin with has some extra structure. But anyway let us uh, work with the cosets and then uh, see what else we can say. So, all the cosets they all look, look alike they all look like uh, uh, h that is what we saw ok. And now uh, as we noticed before for example, if it to uh, like for example, if the case that we considered in R2 if we consider a line that passes through origin and then if we take any, any translation of that line that will be just parallel to the line that we begin with ok. So, these lines they are all disjoint ok either they are equal or disjoint and they form a partition of R2. So, that is what we saw ok. If this is V then X plus V union X in R2. So, that is going to be R2 ok that is very clear. So, this is similar phenomena happens even for general group and gen for their subgroups ok. That is what we are going to prove now. So, here is a small lemma if we take two cosets let us call it x h and y h if the intersection is non empty ok. So, then one can have x h equal to y h ok. That means, if you take two cosets either they are disjoint or they are equal ok these are all the two possibilities. So, let us prove this ok. So, here is the proof. So, start with some element call it z from this intersection x h intersection y h. So, then this z will look like x some h 1 and then y some h 2 ok. So, for some h 1, h 2 they come from h. So, now what we want to prove? We want to prove if we take any element here ok. So, so we want to prove this is the climb x h is subset of y h and y h is sub subset of x h. So, both these cosets containing each other ok. So, now you start with some element here let us call it x h coming from x h. So, now how do we say this is actually indeed element of y h ok we have to use this element e z ok. So, but look at this element ok from this equation star. So, what we get from the star? So, star gives us x h 1 h 2 inverse is nothing but y ok. So, we want to say that this x h is same as some y h dash ok. So, that means this is amount to saying ok this is what we need to prove. So, this is what we need to prove and that means this is same as saying y inverse x h is indeed inside capital H ok. So, that is what we need to do. But let us look at this. So, this is something we already have. So, then if I take y inverse x ok then that is going to be h1 h2 inverse equal to identity. So, y inverse h is nothing but h2 h1 inverse. So, that is what this equation gives. So, this equation gives us this. 
So now if you multiply y inverse x h, so it is going to be h2 h inverse h, but this is going to be where because h1 h2 both come from your subgroup. So this h is also coming from your subgroup, okay. this h is also coming from your subgroup, so this is going to be in h. Okay. So that is what we wanted to prove. Okay. That means this x h is indeed inside this y h. Okay. And converse is also very clear that is I will leave it to you to actually check because indeed if you think about it what we proved, we proved that x h intersection y h is non-empty immediately implies y inverse x is in h. Okay. And from this it is not hard to see that x h is contained in y h. And note that this also will imply x inverse y is in h because this is same as y inverse x ka inverse. Okay. So then this implies again by the similar reasoning y h is contained in x h. So by assuming this we conclude these two are true. So that means x h is same as y h. Okay. So indeed to summarize, okay, if we take two left cosets of H in G, either they are equal or they are disjoint. Okay. But clearly G will be union of x h, x in G. Why? Because if I take x h, then x h by definition h, x h, h in h. Okay. In particularly x is inside this x h. Okay. So that means G is subset of union of x, x h, x in G. But of course, all these are subsets of G, so this must be true. So now, this indeed actually gives you partition, okay? Because of this fact, okay? If you take any two left cosets, either they are equal or they are disjoint, so that means I can only collect those are disjoint, okay? So that means I will be getting some indexing set, call it lambda. So this is the indexing set for the disjoint left cosets of H and G. So then the G will be disjoint union of let us say X come from lambda X H. Okay. And later we will actually identify this capital lambda with what is called this G mod H. Okay. So, maybe I will I will do it now itself, it is not a problem. So, we can define what is called this G mod H. For example, it is motivated from, uh, from the linear algebra. Okay. For example, if you consider uh, a subspace W, then we always write V modulo W for the quotient. Okay. So, V modulo W. So, because of that, uh, that uh, this, this notation actually kind of suggested by that. So, what is G mod H? So, G mod H or the collection of all the left cosets. So, X H where X is in coming from G. And uh, from this fact, if you take two left cosets, either they are equal or disjoint. So, if you take the disjoint, the distinct ones, they are all disjoint. Okay, so that collection is we denote it by G mod H. And if you think about it, there is a natural correspondence between capital lambda and then G mod H, because they, so this capital lambda is the indexing set. Okay, so this you can treat it as a subset of G, and then you collect 
only the one element from each coset okay which are all from the dis distinct cosets and that will correspond to this g mod h okay. So, let us do some examples to understand more about this indexing set okay this is where some people will have difficulties. For example, if we take this r2 and then h to be x axis okay. So, then you can see that pictorially so this is your x axis and then any coset that corresponds to our uh, our uh, uh, coset uh, coset of this x axis. So, that will be a line which is parallel to this x axis okay. So, that is what we saw. So, this is going to be the line. So, then all these lines which are parallel to this x axis. So, those are all the cosets that we are interested in. But is there any natural indexing set for these cosets? Of course, there is. For example, what we noticed there is this unique point 0 comma x naught that is lying inside that coset. For example, if we take this 0 comma x naught plus this x axis, so that is your coset corresponding to that point. Okay. So, I, I guess we denote it by x2 x1 x2. So, this is your x1 x2 plus x axis. So, then this x2 which is fixed that is going to be the natural uh, uh, thing to actually that identify this coset. Okay. But if you think about it where this x2 varies that x2 varies actually y axis. So, that means if I take this r2 modulo h then there is a natural bijective correspondence between this and y axis ok. So, each each element here 0 comma y that is going to define a line parallel to this x axis that is what we are saying and that will be just given by 0 comma y plus x axis ok. But if you think about it, so you can take any line that is parallel to y axis. So, that will give you indexing set ok. I can take any line parallel to this x axis and then you can see that this line that is parallel to y axis will intersect exactly at one point for each this cosets corresponding to x axis ok. If you take any any line that is parallel to that is parallel to this x axis it will intersect exactly at one point. So, for example, any line parallel to y axis is natural indexing set for R2 modulo h, but R2 modulo h is nothing but all x power plus h where x power comes from R2. Okay. So, we can also do similarly for other examples that we have already seen. So, let us do it for the circle that uh, unit circle. So, here is your complex punctured complex plane and then we saw that the unit circle is somewhere here okay. and then if you take any coset, so that will look like something like this z s 1 which is nothing but some r time s 1 if you think about it ok. So, now what will be the natural uh, indexing set for example, I can take this ray. So, which is 0 comma infinity. So, this is as natural 1 to 1 correspondence between c cross divided by s 1 because each coset looks like r times s 1. And not only that we can also take any ray which is uh, which you can get it from this 0 comma infinity and then rotate it with the angle theta. So, this ray is also an indexing set indexing set for this c cross to the base 1 because if you take any ray it will exactly intersect with this uh, circle which is centered at 0 at exactly 1 point. Okay, that is why it, it gives us indexing set. Okay, so, all these uh, 
indexing set everything has very natural uh, geometrical meaning okay they are not randomly chosen they are very specifically chosen most of the time we will actually work with this natural thing that we actually identified so we will also see so we will also observe something about them and then uh, for example they will also form a group okay this is y axis even though it is natural this this has another extra property so this is also a group okay somehow this group is going to actually uh, give us some structure on this uh, left hand side r2 modulo h so that we will see later which will be called quotient group and they come from what is called normal subgroups so this cosets they are very very important concept so so that's what uh, actually allows us to define normal subgroups and quotient groups and so on quotient groups they are very important uh, notions they actually they are used to create new new groups from the already existing groups or known groups okay so i will actually end with uh, one more example for example again you can take this c cross and then uh, consider the subgroup to be the 0 comma infinity okay so the picture looks something like this so this is the ray your subgroup okay so then the cosets are of the form like this so this is your 0 comma infinity which i denoted by r plus then e power i theta r plus will be the coset okay so now if you ask me what will be the coset for example i can take unit circle okay so this s1 so this s1 will be naturally one to one correspondence with c cross mod h okay not only that we can also take any any circle which is centered at zero okay so that will be again parametrizing set for this uh, c cross modulo h but this s1 is somewhat special because that is what gives us another group okay so we will see later like what is the connection between these two and so on. okay so in the next class uh, again we will see uh, more properties of this cosets and then how the notion of cosets naturally motivates us to look for normal subgroups and then uh, from normal subgroups how one can actually get quotient groups so those things we will see i'll stop here thank you